I'm there. Hello, welcome everybody to Sonic Talk, episode number 461, recording today live Wednesday the 31st of August. Kind of feels like the end of summer, although I feel like we deserve several more weeks of nice weather, considering how basically rubbish it's been but i won't go on about the weather it's a very british thing and i know that some of you are not from britain and probably the weather's fine and has been wherever you are although i am actually still going on about the weather never mind right uh, sonic talk is the podcast that deals with all things to do with music production live production uh, electronic music synthesizers effects software programming uh, all kinds of stuff that surrounds the the technology of making music in the world uh, please do subscribe we can uh, always do with more people we have a weekly show wednesday 4 p.m uk time uh, you can join us either in the the youtube chat room or if you go to sonicstate.com forward slash live you get the youtube video stream and we have our own isc channel so you decide you can flip flop between them or try doing both of them although I can't do that quite. I've got them both open, but it's very hard for me to follow. So uh, I want to say thank you very much also to our sponsors, uh, Isotope, uh, who will be uh, giving away a copy of Vocal Synth, their vocal processing plugin, uh, a little bit later on. That's about halfway through, and we'll be announcing the winner from last week, so do stay tuned. Anyway, let's join our guests. Uh, we've got a sort of... It feels... When everybody comes back together after the, 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 the festival season, there is a sort of sense that the summer has, has run its course a little bit. So, uh, But I will welcome our guests. We'll start with... Oh, let's start with mr dave spears from g4 software in his synth cave uh who is there uh last time we spoke to you dave it was there were lots of things in disarray and cases open and stuff are you uh, is everything now have you reached the zenith is it that sort of special moment where everything's working which doesn't happen very often i'd imagine no it never happens no <laughs> uh no uh no we had i had somebody here yesterday uh, so we had to have a kind of big tidy up and put some things in place for it was actually Billy Curry uh, came yesterday for a couple of things which was which is always really really good fun because we just kind of drill in for information about Ultravox old days and stuff like that ah. so yes we had a tidy up because it was a VIP Right, okay. I know that feeling. I tidied up here um, not that long ago. It's very hard to tell. I mean, I never try and show anything below the waist in this room, and it's not because I've, I'm you know, trying to hide anything personally on my body. It's just because on the floor is a complete mess of wires and tangle because everything has to be moved around all the time. So I, when, I, when we invite people around, we have to sort of create a, a walkway that people get through and find the chair amongst the piles of stuff that's all over the place. But I can totally understand that. Anyway, Dave, of course, uh, makes a fine software instruments. Uh, Summer, I, there's, when did, isn't it about time you had a release? It's, it seems like ages. Is there something on the horizon? I, no, I, I know you probably won't say anything, but you know, because <laughs> no. but it's, it feels like a long time. Yeah, might might be, might be. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah we're you're working. Work, you're working on something. That's, working, that's all you need yeah. to say. Chris didn't have a holiday this year, so yeah, that should be an indication that we're working. Right. Well, I had a holiday. I was away this weekend. I went to Butlins in Minehead, which is not a very glamorous holiday, but it was lovely weather and had a very nice time. So I feel somewhat refreshed. So that's good. Anyway, thanks for joining us, Dave. Uh, we'll also head over to uh, Gaz Williams in Bristol. Gaz Williams, of course, producer, bass player, music technologist, although rather absent on the Sonic channel recently. We're hoping to fix that quite soon because we know we've got a pile of things that uh, he's been poking his nose into and uh, evaluating. So I'm hoping. How are you, Gaz? Are you well? Are you festival out? Ah, uh, kind of, yeah. I mean, I've just more or less finished, well, finished first draft of an album today. It's... Uh chap called dave green it's actually on crowdfunder so check him out because it's he's brilliant but it's uh acoustic based music but i've done that melodyne four thing with it where i got him just to play all the songs just in in his own time because he's a he's a solo acoustic guitarist and singer just to play them acu uh, instrumentally acoustically and then take them into melodyne four and then make the beautiful tempo mapping i mean you do have to have to learn how to do it but the tempo maps that you get from it, then I can extract from Melodyne and I build a new project in Cubase based on that tempo map. And the reason why I'm doing all of that is that it's the feel of the acoustic guitar that defines all the bar lines then in Cubase. So any kind of snapping or anything, it's just aligns everything with the acoustic guitar. And we've done drums and we've done loads of things and we've aligned everything to the acoustic guitar. So the acoustic guitar's movement forward and backwards and accelerations and stuff is completely fluid with everything that follows it. And the effect is marvellous. I can't recommend it enough. 
blows my mind. Wow, yeah, I know you've talked about this before, and it sounds like you yeah. know the fr- you've actually f- um, the final product. When when are we going to see it? Uh, I think it's due out at the end of October. But I mean, I think if there's uh, yeah, Dave Green, his name is. Check him out. He's great. He's really good, actually. So yeah, I've been uh, just the reason why I mentioned that though is because I have been talking about that Temple Map stuff for a while and just using it on a regular ta- regular process now. It just feels like it's the technology. You know, it's that thing about the musicians. I've got hold of the grid yeah. after 30 years of the bastards, you know, of that, of that mechanical, the musicians have got the grid. So that's the thing, you see. So, yes, I think it's brilliant. Because when I set that lot behind me, uh, 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 I can't make you see it. There. Uh, all that lot follows the guitar. So all the kind of... Ah, so machines. all the clock, you can just have it. Oh, nice. Yeah, so all the drum machines and sequences and everything just kind of move with that kind of acoustic feeling. It's so it's so much fun. Anyway, there we go. Wow, well, that sounds great fun. I'm glad to hear it. Well, welcome anyway, Gaz, GazWilliams.com. <laughs> and we also have the return visit of our new guy, uh, Charles Chicky Reeves, who is based in London. Uh, front house engineer, producer, mix engineer. Um, you can see he's in his... Uh, lovely uh, studio it's not a dungeon it's studio shed very posh outbuilding i'd say it's more maybe converted uh um uh, let, let, let's say converted stable just for the sake of it it sounds like that it's you know it's actually a purpose-built building it's ah. like a, a company from poland comes in they flat pack everything they bring it in they put it up it's up in about a week and then they finish it off like doing all the sound stuff that i required it takes about another month and then it's ready to roll it's got wow. power it's got running water it's excellent <laughs> wow that's so neat. is it dismantleable as well could you move it somewhere else if you had to no i couldn't it, um it's but it's it doesn't have a foundation in the normal sense it uses pylons but um but yeah it's it's really it's a really solid structure but no you can't it's not like ikea you can't take it apart uh, well then again I, ikea you can't really take apart either i mean you can but good luck getting it back together but um yeah, it's but it's a great it's a great space and and I have the rest of my house completely wired up. So I um I've, I've run looms all the way to the house so I can record full bands and then some in there. So I are have you like a ru- big are you running there. um uh regular copper or are you running Cat Five network stuff? I'm ru- I'm running copper. I'm running copper. Um and I, but it's uh but I can I can rerun it pretty easily without having to dig up anything because it's it's all via pipes. Uh, so, so have I you got just, that really long it, piece of string that you can pull in a big loop yes. to get it through? Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> that's right. That's right. Um, hey, I did want to say something. Dave was talking about um, about uh, Ultravox. So I just want to say I do have a John Fox shirt on in honor of Ultravox. Hey. So there you go. <laughs> is that a poly? That, is that a Polymoog rendition on there? I think so. Yeah, I, I, I actually haven't looked at it that closely here. So I think it's quite closer. hard to see when it's actually on your own chest. It could be. Yes, it is. I never really looked down, but I love the shirt. So you know, nice. I've got a really good one from Howard Jones. Has one that's um, a Jupiter Eight, which is very similar to this. So maybe I'll wear that next time. <laughs> Excellent. Well, I'm glad to maybe, you know, the Sonic Talk fashion accessories is something we haven't looked into yet. So maybe we can figure out, we could get some kind of uh, uh, monochrome type renditions of each of our heads, perhaps. Or perhaps not. That's good. Yeah, 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 yeah. absolutely. <laughs> I'm not sure I want to see my face on a T-shirt anywhere, really, I, uh, to be honest. But I don't know, just, just, just running it out there as a sort of jam idea. Right, let's get on to things. Uh, now... The first thing, is, I'm going to play this because I don't know quite what it's going to do about the YouTube police because obviously this is big at the moment. I mean, this is really big. This is obviously the um, the Netflix series Stranger Things, which seems to have blown up really massive. I'm talking because I'm hoping the YouTube police won't catch it. Soundtrack by uh, Kyle Dixon and Michael, Sh- Michael Stein from uh, Survive, Austin, Texas band. And it just seems to have gone huge, and everybody there are people sort of posting their versions of this, and some of the there's a lot of uh, of the time incidental music as well, but there are all these moments that they put in in terms, and it's just very analog and lovely, and it's absolutely. I won't play anymore because I know that the YouTube copyright police will get will get it, but it's just gone absolutely huge, and uh, I think it's great because uh, when you sort of see. I, I must admit, I, I'm trying to get an interview with them at the moment because I think it'd be really interesting. And I suddenly had a moment where I thought, oh, God, what if they only use soft synths? You know, that would be because hmm. it sounds so analog. But then, you know, obviously, if you're working on cues, so, 
analog synths are probably not the best way to go because it's a question of you you're, you're in a world of hell when they go actually we've changed the timings of all this you need to redo it and when you've got all those moves and what have you you can't do that but it's massive has anyone seen it? i think chicky you said you'd actually watch the series i haven't i don't have netflix so i don't have time i've, been, I've now binge watched it three times which what? is really upsetting <laughs> Well, don't tell us what happened. Chagrin of my missus. <laughs> I know. All I gotta say is at the very end. No, uh, yeah, it's great. I, I think yeah, obviously they they've done just such an excellent job with this, and and it's similar to any any soundtrack work I've ever done. It's like it's one of those things where they get really involved with the directors, and you know, and it's and they're building it as as things are being shot. They're they're doing music as it's being shot. And uh, so they're very involved in that. It's not one of those things where someone shows up with a bunch of rushes and say, hey, here's what we've done. Make something happen with it. It's They've been very involved all along the way. And and I'm also really happy on another note, the fact that they're from Austin. Because I, I learned to record in Austin, Texas. And when I was there, and I would occasionally get work out in New York doing house music, it's like, you mentioned house music in Austin and you know, or anything electronic. And they go, uh, is that like? Depeche Mode or something like that. You know, every, everything was like Depeche Mode. So it, to see a thriving electronic music scene happening out of Austin and out of Denton, which is just north of Dallas, it's pretty exciting stuff. So, so there you go. Yeah, nice. I think the. Uh, I, I mean, I, I, it, it sort of feels like they've been plucked from some kind of obscurity, but that's only because I don't know about. It. I mean, they may have already been pretty massive. I mean, I, I know they had a few albums out, and uh, they seem to have, they 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 capture this sort of notion of. Uh, atmospheric melodic electronic music which i think is 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 quite often absent when people use synthesizers sometimes it can be a little bit too experimental for many and they seem to have kind of nailed that pretty well i know gaz have you had a chance to watch this i don't know if you're a netflix a netflix user but you kind of escape the fact that it's everywhere and people talking about it and what have you or maybe you have i don't watch anything i haven't watched anything i'm talking like a tv thing or hardly maybe in the last 20 years i've wow. hardly watched yeah i gave up telly 1993 so uh that sounds yeah. like there was a very specific reason for that was it were you just outraged at the presentation style of the latest blue peter or what was it it was an advert <laughs> for for clearasil that was like oh it was like someone would hold up a piece of pizza there was all these like attractive people all together and he and someone go remind you of someone you know and then the said person who's meant to be spotty turns up on their skins all clear and the girls are kind of like around him and it's all like what does that say? It says so many things. So I had enough, and I did a, I did a really cool flying sidekick and smashed the telly up. Pow! <laughs> and then, <laughs> and you can't go back on that. Then you can't go back on that. <laughs> so what happens if the TV goes on that you're in a room in? Do you have to uh, make excuses, or do you just look away? How does that uh, manifest itself? Um. So I can't be in a room when the telly's on. It's terrible because I'm like watching yeah. it. You know, boom, it's like an boom. open open fire, isn't it? Yeah. Just yeah. So it's uh, so yeah. I can't. I can't. Wow. <laughs> yeah. That, but that, I, yeah. Go on. Sorry. No, that that that. <laughs> brought out an anecdote that i wasn't expecting uh, to be perfectly honest gaz and i'm very pleased that we've you've shared that with us because it, it's an insight into i mean you know you've got plenty of other stuff to do obviously and 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 like me you spend a lot of time sitting in front of a screen anyway so sometimes it's yeah. kind of nice not to even though it's further yeah. away <laughs> yeah but you know i think the amount of stuff that is probably ace that i miss you know it's just you know i it's I've seen a lot of telly, you know, in my life. Okay, I right. I I've think, got a problem yeah. now. Here, here's here is I'm gonna I'm gonna throw this at you because I just want to see how you react. Someone rings you up and says, "Can you do the soundtrack to my upcoming TV series?" Yeah, do it, and then I'd watch it for the job. Ah, for okay. Sure. You, you yeah. would okay. Uh, so it's not yeah. that black and white, right? Okay. No, it's just it's just a lifestyle choice. Yeah, yeah. No, know. fair enough. But it's a great, um, the, <laughs> Dave. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you sent a video in actually which i wanted to play was uh, survive playing at moogfest uh 2014 so it was it a couple of years ago i think it was a boiler room thing i think i got a video of it uh, did i play something Th this is them and it's absolutely great although terrible camera angle for the synth spotters or maybe not terrible depending on whether or not you're kind of i'm guessing that one in the front is that an sh5 or an sh1 You'll know. Five. It's a five. Oh, I'm as close. I can spot the Monopoly, which is in front of the guy in the red, but I have no idea what anybody else is playing. You, you think that the one underneath is the ARP soloist, right? Uh, it's a Solus. Solus. Okay. 
He does some great stuff. I won't play too much because, again, the YouTube play. But I really enjoyed that set. It was very melodic. So this is kind of, it feels like a kind of real good time story, doesn't it? That, you know, these guys who are essentially have probably been considered very niche for a long time are now, you know, compositional superstars. It's very interesting, this. I've been ill. I've been pretty ill. Oh, yes, uh, of and you're... I was consigned to bed. Uh, my doctor went, just go and rest. You have to. Here's, here's tons of antibiotics. Take these and go and rest. Uh, so I subscribed to Netflix and did the whole series in one hit. And it's really quite interesting because at first I was like, well, it's just a synthesizer theme tune thing in a kind of 80s stuff. In fact... It reminds me, and I know why, it reminds me, do you remember that Pink Floyd, Welcome to the Machine? That opening title really reminds me of that, and I think it's that kind of profit resonant sweep, you know, that kind of does it, but there's, a, there's like a, obviously it's got the arpeggio and stuff under there, but I was like, so it's, I mean, I enjoyed the series, lost the plot towards the end a little bit, but I won't ruin anything for anybody who hasn't seen it. Um... <laughs> And I like the, you know, all the kind of foley stuff and the, the noises and the sound effects. I did read a couple of things in moment of uh, almost hallucinating about things like that, about what they'd done there, what they'd used. And, and then I suddenly thought, well, actually, it's quite interesting, isn't it? Because I kind of hope that in a way, you know, there's a lot of noise being made about this soundtrack and it's very, very 80s. Yeah. And I was kind of thinking, you know, it's that the 80s are hip again. But I was kind of thinking it would be really interesting, wouldn't it? It would be really nice if somebody who wasn't connected with synths heard that and went, oh, I'm going to get into that or I'm going to kind of research that or discover that. But it, it would be great if it turned them on in exactly the same way as an old git like me listen, got the same <laughs> vibe listening to Starsky and Hutch or the Rockford Files. When that synth line came in on the Rockford yeah. Files, it was like, I have to know what that is. Yeah. So, yeah, it was kind of, it brought back all sorts of weird, weird things. I wonder if, I mean, the other thing, I wonder it, 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 in the same way that, you know, when, uh, you know, orchestral recording for soundtracks became de rigueur and people were like wow i'm getting to use a real orchestra because you know frankly it's a load of hassle you know so it's it's something that will balloon the expenses and what have you i wonder if the the fact that people are using this kind of temperamental old pieces of technology to make it gives it a certain cachet as well and makes it almost more handcrafted and and, and skillfully made rather than a massive contact library and you know the usual this is the usual i mean thing. this is john carpenter isn't it yeah. i mean really you know john carpenter used to compose as he was making the film and stuff. So I think uh, there's certainly an element of that. I was fairly ambivalent about it until I and somebody sent me that link to the Moogfest thing. And, you know, I mean, I know the Odyssey and the ARP thing inside out. And when that guy starts to use that solace in that way, and also the other, the guy nearest to us at the bottom is using a little, uh, an old SCI 6 track. Ah, I and, wondered if it was that, yeah. You know, this stuff, we know this, you know, using this stuff live is not, it's not an easy gig. But and I love the idea of like them just kind of, you know, four guys, right, okay. We're a synth quadro or whatever they're called mm -hmm. now. <laughs> yeah, and it, yeah. I, I thoroughly recommend watching that. Sorry, Gaz, yeah. It just feels very zeitgeist, doesn't it? You know, t John Carpenter's touring, it's, you know, it just lots of things and just the massive resurgence of affordable cool synths it all just feels like everything's of the moment you know and that this feels like the inevitable thing of when I've, zeitgeisty elements all i've hit meet. the zenith yeah the apex um chicky you were talking about uh, soundtrack work i mean you've got a bunch of analog stuff i mean do you do you hesitate before reaching for it when you're working in that with that kind of thing because of the repeatability issue uh no uh, well it's worth the risk um you know mentioning about uh about orchestras being the the pretty much what all soundtracks have been for the past well since the 1930s coincidentally i happen to be discussing a a, a film's film that's coming out in 2018 that i'm going to be doing all the all the scoring for i've written a lot of music for it already and um, it's it's a Victorian setting. It's an animated film with some big stars and whatever. But it's a it's sort of Victorian time period. But I'm actually going to do all the soundtrack using synths because I can do sounds where no one goes, "Oh, that's a violin," or "That's you know a synthesizer." Instead, it'll be like 
they won't know what the sound is. It'll be just this unique thing that that really enhances the emotion. And because I'm honestly, I, I, my background is also in scoring and using orchestras, but I'm just I'm kind of tired of doing that. And I've, I've, it's been done so much, so I'm really excited about this whole thing of using synths for all sorts of stuff. And even even with regards to these guys, there is a retro thing. This yeah yeah, the eighties are cool again. Or I mean, the eighties has sort of been cool for a while, but like this is something quite different. This is like a specific genre within eighties that has become cool, which is I find personally very exciting. It's the it's the electronic experimental electronic stuff from the eighties is now a very cool thing to have going on. And I, I hope every every film soundtrack has stuff like that. So, and, you so know. when you're when you're working on this Victorian uh, uh, atmosphere, are you going to allow any resonance or filter sweeps? Because there was one thing that they said in <laughs> in that is they weren't allowed to do any resonant filter sweeps. And maybe yeah. the sound that we hear is is possibly sync. I don't know, but that's what that's the one thing that was kind of you know uh, you can't go there. And their stuff isn't very resonanty. It's quite it's quite flat in that sort of John Carpenter way. You know, it's not right. Quite, so I, I know are you going to be able to slip some of that in or are you going to try and just find fixed points no i well, well no there I, I in fact what i do is when i track in um like when i when i do soundtracks i'll typically just watch the film from start to finish and i'll go through and i get my op1 or or whatever and i'll just i'll improvise all the way through then do another track of improvisation all the way through so i'll watch the film 10 15 times which is takes a long time, obviously, but I'll just constantly improvise. And the way I build different sections is actually opening up a filter, pulling it back a bit, opening it up again, you know, just to, to get that ebb and flow. But resonance I won't use because that's extremely distracting. So ah. I, I stay away. So from you that, go for yeah. Evangelist style, isn't there? That 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 I went over, went to uh, visit uh, guys at Real World. Those that that the 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 legend that uh, chariots of chariots of fire was improvised effectively start to finish and it was just at the piano played the whole thing and then went back and kind of stuck some synths under it (laughs) and that was kind of basically the whole thing was done in one go in sort of from almost subconscious kind of improvisation which is uh, would be a pretty neat way to do it just have to watch the film once yeah i've done there you go thank you very much that'll be a million quid like i'll use this uh the the, i'm talking to you from the roads right now it's not that it's computerized roads, but roads. But um, I'll I'll sit at the roads, and I have a memory man, and I'll keep the feedback almost all the way up, and I'm just playing stuff all the way through it. I make sure I've always got something recording, even if it's just a handheld recorder. There's always something recording, but you know I'll have the film running on a screen and Pro Tools just running for sometimes twelve hours, you know, and I'll just just constantly play everything in, and then I'll go there and find what what i like what works and what doesn't work and i'm quite quite merciless about you know what i get rid of i'm i'm not i'm not uh uh what's the word i'm not precious about anything at all and um but i love the idea of improv improv improvising through a film absolutely love it and i feel like that's that's true to the emotion of the film otherwise you know i could write a piece and then try to shoehorn it into the film but rarely does that work so mm, that's interesting isn't it i mean i remember uh, do you remember dave um what was it? The hyperprism stuff, which was all gestural, and it was to do with real time affecting. It was. It came out in the late eighties, early nineties, and it was. That was the whole idea to automate these things as you watch picture. I mean, lots of people were using it for that, weren't they? And I, and I know the Spectrosonics thing also has. Uh, you know, the, the iPad of where, where you can kind of gestural, gestur, gesturize, gesture, gesture your way through the film, and you get these kind of visceral interactions with it which you can then translate to some kind of sound thing i mean i don't know if that's a a thing is that a thing gaz for you yeah but it made me think of that fantastic phrase to gesticulate to talk bollocks but in a really big way to gesticulate uh yeah no? yes yeah. <laughs> sorry <laughs> he said to while test- gesticulating <laughs> no to testiculate i got it wrong ah, to I'd testiculate testiculate i don't know that one that's a new one i yeah. like the sound of that <laughs> talk a load of bollocks but in a big sort of in a yeah, big gesturalized way <laughs> well anyway yeah. I, you know, sorry i was gonna say that that does remind me um with what gaz is talking about those uh image and heat gloves it, like you can use to as a they have like motion you know they have gyroscopic sensors in them and so forth and you could use that and just sort of improvise by using your hands i know i shouldn't be using my hands on camera so much but but um you, sh- you should you could use use body movement to to really feel a film out, you know, and that could work. And yeah. do some pretty amazing I've things, all, whenever yeah. I've seen her performing with those, they've always been a little bit kind of 
uh, and what's you know it's been difficult to kind of understand what they're actually doing and 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 I think with those gestural things they tend to you have to work to the way that they translate rather than you just do your thing as you would normally do it'd have to be re completely calibrated for you but an interesting idea yeah. but yes stranger things and if you check out survive the soundtrack uh, the, all their albums stuff, it's all very much of the same mood i mean the thing about what i've heard of the actual soundtrack you can get it on itunes is the the the, the sound of it is just really analog you know there's there's something i don't know what they're going through what their process is and i'm hoping that we can interview them and talk about it how those big fat synthesizers sound especially more so i don't know what their signal path because it's got something about it that's whether it's apis or you know fairchild or whatever it may be it's just something that's really juicy about it that really kind of or a valve uh, console and tape machine so yeah there you, go. <laughs> you think that might be it yeah i hope so yeah <laughs> Yeah, I mind you, it. if you had a valve console and tape machine in uh, Austin, you'd need some serious air conditioning because it yeah. would get to kind of 200 degrees. You could cook. You could just, yeah, wow. Anyway, um, uh, let's let's go to our sponsors just for a minute. Just so uh, we'll get that out of the way and we can get on to some more topics. So I want to say thank you to Isotope. Uh, here it comes. I think this is the right button. I certainly hope so. It always fails me whenever I start pressing it. And that's just the way it goes, I suppose. But... Uh, there we are. Isotopes, vocal synth, multi moduled vocal pressing. We've got harmonizer, up to five harmonies, unisons, sub octaves. This is the polyvox. And there's also regular vocoder. Box, which is more, it sounds more like the sort of Sennheiser thing, and then the talk box, as I like to say, without the dribbling. All of these are available in the same thing. If you want to check it out, you can go to isotope.com forward slash vocal synth and you can download a full demo. Think outside the box, isotope.com slash vocal synth. And of course, we also have competition from last week, uh, which was. Uh, uh, what did we ask you to uh, tweet? We asked you to tweet uh, not just vocoder and vocal synth as hashtags, and we have a winner. Uh, and I'm going to really try and pronounce his name because it's it's difficult for me because I don't know how you would pronounce it. It's uh, Steve Tarazowski, I think, uh, and he's at S A Tarazowski Zuski. I hope I've got that right. Uh, and he tweeted uh, the winning entry, and it says, can't have too much of this stuff. So obviously he's looking forward to getting his hands on it. So if you get in touch, Steve, uh, we will get Isotope to uh, bung you a copy of that into your account, and you'll be all set. And, of course, this week we're asking you once again, they're being super generous, we're giving yet another copy of this away. And this week we're asking you to tweet the hashtag Ultimate Voice and the hashtag Vocal Synth to at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. That's the hashtag Ultimate Voice, that's one word, and the hashtag Vocal Synth to at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. And we will pick a winner from next week's show. So once again, we thank Isotope for their continued sponsorship of the show and always nice to have them on. Right, so uh, let's see what's next. It feels like we should probably... Uh, uh, let's go to this one. This is kind of an interesting um, web page uh, called Funklet, funklet.com. And it's just a whole bunch of grooves uh, listed by drummer. My favourite name being Zigaboo Modelista, who is from the Meters, who is, in my opinion, one of the finest uh, drummers known to men. Because, uh, I mean, the Meters, when I was uh, remixing, I had the double or the triple album of all of their stuff. And it was like back when sampling was the thing. It was just every single groove you can... And quite a lot of these grooves are the sort of grooves that have been sampled. And you basically, if you just uh, load up a page, I'll just run that up, you get... They've written this little sequencer, and it just... Showing the groove, basically. This is uh, Sissy Strut. Obviously, drum machine style, but it gives you an idea of what the groove is doing, and that this little slider here will affect the slide, uh, affect the swing. And obviously, I went too far there, but there's a whole bunch of them here, and I'm sure, Dave, there's going to be some that make you happy, because Stevie Wonder. But it's a really uh, here we go. It's, uh, this was a really cool because it's also got little uh, bits of information, and this one was the the thing that really surprised me. I'm just trying to load this now. Uh, I decided not to load. That's awesome. 
<laughs> but basically, this uh, here we go. Stevie Wonder Superstition. And uh, there's a little quote below, which is from Jeff Batten. He said, I actually played the original drums, which inspired the groove for Superstition. Stevie was out of the room when I was just messing around on the drum kit. And he came in and said, don't stop. And I said, Stevie, it's me. I, can't, I don't play the drums. And he said, I don't care. Just keep playing. And he got on the clavinet, and that gave birth to the groove, which I think is a fantastic story. So this is... It's, you know, fairly straightforward groove. And you can just imagine... Badum, dum, dum, badum, dum, 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 dum. Oh, I'll stop that. And I just thought this was um, really handy because most of us, you know, most of the programming of beats, either you take a sample or you're taking loops and constructing or you're using fairly straightforward. This is when I'm talking programming beats rather than playing drums or whatever. And to see them deconstructed like that is really cool. Uh, but some of them don't quite work. And it's not that their swing's wrong. It's just there's something magic the bernard purdy word especially it's just it's not that you know it didn't really happen and there's something that bernard purdy does that you can't do with a drum machine basically uh dave i'm going to come to you first because i know you did a lot of uh, sort of groove extraction and studying and what have you it's a nice little feature but i mean you know you must know about the minutiae of it you got drummers to actually play the grooves on electronic drum kits right when you were doing yours yeah yeah Is- and that was fascinating going in and analysing. Grace notes, really. I mean, somebody like Purdy, it's all about... Obviously, there's the groove, but it's the grace notes underneath that kind of make the thing bigger than the sum. And that's very difficult to, you know, represent in a kind of grid format. Yeah, because the velocity is so... Yeah, and have the right voicings for each each of the velocities of a grace note, yeah. I did a really long series in magazine... Uh, in a magazine over here called Style Council years ago and uh, that was just analysing and just going in and this was a, I, I, actually I thought this was a great resource the one that really conf- actually there was two things that really confused me one was uh, the, the other Stevie Wonder song Knocks Me Off My Feet which I was like why that? I mean Boogie on Reggae Woman or something like that for me would have been more interesting but the Go-Go the unknown Go-Go drummer which of course for me Back in the 90s, Trouble Funk and Chuck oh, Brown. Yeah. I love that whole go-go group. So I kind of went off and did a load of research, you know, back in the day. And it was this guy, Ricky Wellman, who was in Chuck Brown's band. Uh, Dropped the bomb the on the White House lawn and all that. Yeah, I mean, oh, I love that. And then, of course, that got nicked on Slave to... Well, that wasn't nicked, but the, the go-go pattern was borrowed for Slave to the Rhythm and stuff like that. And all of a sudden, that became kind of ubiquitous but it was interesting on this that you know they couldn't attribute it to one particular drummer but yeah really good really good little resource i mean it's funny some of the names it'd be nice to see it evolve i've been listening to this guy you know this robert glass uh glaster glaceber 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 he's a guy called um day uh, chris dave is this drummer and he's just like He's definitely going to be a legend, definitely. He's mm-hmm. sort of phenomenal. He's a bit like kind of Tony Williams in another century. Um, yeah, fascinating. Anyway, uh, yeah, um, thank you for this. Uh, no, good. I'm also surprised that I didn't see Richie Hayward on there, who was the Little Feet drummer, who is possibly the grooviest man in the world at that kind of slow swamp group. I, 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 I've never heard anybody who can play like that. And he, if you go back and listen to some of the classic Little, little Feet grooves, you know, last record album... Uh, and I, I forgot. I used to listen to them loads, and there's th- and they were they were produced. A lot of those were en- or engineered by George Massenberg. And there's a drum break in uh, I think it's down below the borderline, which just goes on for ages. And it's just he's obviously got a massive drum kit, and he just goes dum 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 dum, and you hear every single tom in isolation. It's just like wow, that sounds mm-hmm. so so good. I don't know. And Gaz, I'm sure you've probably got some favourite drummers. Um, and this is very much seems to be very much geared around the kind of the hip-hop generation and the classic breakbeats you know funky drummer and all that sort of stuff right yeah because yeah you know because it's like no steve gadd on there there's a lot of beats sort of like kind of um classic drum beats that aren't on there but they, this is all yeah this is all like breaks isn't it and that sort of thing uh it's lovely though i love all the i love the fact that there's little historical anecdotes about it it's brilliant i really like this i think it's a really cool thing so yeah long may it grow you know, I, I think, um, yeah, you know, it, there's, 
it's almost so easy just to fall into default drum patterns, isn't there? You know, when you go and program it. But someone like um, Zigaboo Model S, you know, his beats... His, They're just mad his beats, as well, aren't they? They're, they are, they are. You just... Yeah, so, yeah, I think this is ace. Yeah, really cool. And also, you can um, you can use the grid and make your own beats and then export the MIDI files. You can export all the MIDI files from all of these things, which is kind of cool. I don't know, it's pretty neat. What, uh, Charles, what do you, what's your kind of approach to, to grooves and drums? Do you just get a drummer in, or do you kind of, how do you build yours up? Well, um, a lot of times I'll play stuff. Uh, um, like finger drumming like, kind of thing? Well, no, I mean, if you look on wikipedia there's a picture of me playing drums <laughs> so i'm also ah. i play drums too but um i don't think i'm that great of a drummer i do have a few drummers i go to that i like working with um although i do i do a lot of programming um and yeah, the uh well, you know one thing i liked about this page was that the the grooves you know if you if you look in you can see that there's a lot of offsets and you know, like the two and the four is a bit late on the clyde silverfield stuff which is great i love that kind of stuff but on a side note, and I think part of what makes uh, a dr- like a break so good is not just the the playing, but the but the, it is the engineer behind it too. And I'm not speaking of self interest or anything, but these same guys who put this page up, they also make that compressor called Wolf, which is so good. It is such a great compressor. If you follow the link at the bottom of the page, they have like a, a YouTube video showing. It's one of the guys like with one mic in his kitchen playing drums with the compressor ah, going on. Hold on, I've got it here. Let's have a look. Let's just see. It's, uh, it looks very, it's a very simple looking thing. Yeah. Wolf Compressor Demo 001. Uh. Uh. Ah, yeah, I see. Sort of one mic drum kit. Yeah. Yeah, it's that meters vibe, isn't it? <laughs> it's it, and everything it's recorded excellent. really hot and slightly overdriven and kind of. But do you think that was? I mean, because I I get the impression like some of the Motown stuff. I mean, you listen to it and it sounds. I mean, it, you know, if you were listening to it from a kind of pristine uh, engineering, I'd like to record things in the right way kind of thing. You think that's just abhorrent you know it's it's wrong it's distorted it's this is too loud you can't hear that but it's the vibe i mean do you think do you really think that a lot of that stuff was by design i don't know uh no i don't think it was by design i think it just it was just magic that happened at the time but when i whenever i mimic those sorts of things like when i when i mic up a drum kit you know i have one particular mic that i use on kick drum one of those dual element mics and then I'll stick, uh, I have a, one of those uh, hot rotted cascade stereo ribbon mics. And I just sort of stick that out sort of overhead, but just kind of out the room a little bit. Excellent. Perfect drum sound. And, and you know, when the drummer comes in, listens, and he goes, hey, yeah, so uh, do you think you could turn the toms up? I usually go, oh, yeah. So when you go back in to replay it, hit the toms a little harder. Should be fine. <laughs> so, yeah. yeah. Nice. So that's, that's cracking, actually. That, no, there is. I mean, because I know, Gaz, you have a kind of kit that you set up as well. I mean, you know, you're, I know you're a fan of trying to get it with a, as few marks as possible, right? Yeah, yeah, definitely. Um, just, uh, well, actually, this Dave Green album, Overhead and Kick, and it's just so lovely. Um, and in fact, I was just mix, making a mix down in that. So it's just a single mono track. My entire drums, just one mono track just because it's just so malleable and it sounds so fat in the mix. It's brilliant. Um, it was also good for me. I did it that way as well, because as I was mentioning it with that guitar thing, it was just dead easy for me just to sort of snap all of the beats of the kit onto the guitar. So, you know, the guitar and the drums would as one, you know, and, uh, but so just, to, <laughs> I was just thinking, I was listening back to the mix down. So just got the drums how massive and it's just that single mono <laughs> mono drum mix. But yeah, brilliant. Ah, that's cool. I know, Dave, I mean, you know, we b- both came up through studios when it was kind of, and now we're going to get the mic, the drums mic'd, you know, and that would be the first four days of a studio session yeah. or whatever it was. Yeah, and now it's sort of, I mean, I'm guessing it's still the same, but, 
you know, I because I, I used to have a thing. I had a I had an I had a, the, uh, uh, a Rogers drum kit from a nineteen a classic nineteen sixties Rogers drum kit for a long time, and it was the ones where they made the drum heads that you can't buy the drum skins for anymore. So, and it it was boingy, you know, and it had those little skinny kind of tom things, and they used to bounce, and it sounded it was a double skin bass drum, and it sounded like the meters kit. You know, that's why I bought it. It was just absolutely beautiful, red sparkle. And all I used to do is I used to put a stereo mic over it and a mic and a drum kit mic and compress the hell out of it, and that was fine for me. And I used to love, you know, it's a similar sort of sound as to what you're hearing from the Wolf compressor, and that, you know, that was the thing that did it. And, and, and like I was saying, you know, it's it's like this kind of regression, isn't it, back to the simplest way possible. Just get the drummer to do it properly. I guess the problem is is, is there always used to be there's a demand, isn't there, for the grid and the sound, so the drums need to be have so much time spent on them to make them fit the zeitgeist of whatever the sound is at the moment right well and also it was like assistants back in those days wasn't it it was the studio assistant who was the guy who was kind of tasked with the job of making up the kit which was incredibly laborious i mean not least for the drummer but of course those kind of people don't really exist anymore you know go and get me some sweets go and get me some beer mic up my drums i mean i didn't care hey as long as my drum kit looked like it had a thousand mics on it i didn't care if if only two of them works, you know, it was that kind of, it was definitely that 80s ego thing. Maybe that's going to creep in if we're getting into 80s synth sound, you know, we're getting 80s drum ego back again. But it's kind of, yeah, I mean, the Motown thing's fascinating, wasn't it? Because they didn't move the kit for like 20 years because they were frightened of ruining that sound. And I, and I like that, you know, it's like, if the vibe's right and it sounds right and you've got a string of hit records why bother changing stuff really yeah. well just and go also, with I mean, the vibe. and also it's the hit factory isn't it i mean you know that's one of the things that i think is overlooked a little bit about you know there was all this I, i've probably said this before but there's all this stuff in the uk when uh, pwl were you know stock aching and waterman were the sound of pop and everybody was going oh it's terrible it's just a it's just a machine and you go well actually if you look back at what motown were doing it was exactly the same but same. on a much bigger scale so you know you should I, and that's more classic and there was it was less machinery involved admittedly and it was less i don't know if it's less cynical you'd like to think not but given the way that a lot of the musicians were treated you know perhaps it was just as cynical and it yeah was money machines. pwl at least gave points away to some of the programmers and stuff chris has got a very good mate who was it's a fantastic story this guy mike rose and he uh he's like working in mcdonald's but he wants this break so he just sends a take to pwl and that's it bam all of a sudden he just has this huge career he's in there programming and like he's responsible for so many of the hits and it's you don't hear a stories like that now you know i sent this mixtape into pwl and then all of a sudden i, had I this was 20 the guy year career. yeah uh, yeah, well, yeah I, had lot, I had a lot of stories about that because we know um you know that whole method of it's like monkeys and typewriters. You have enough of them, then, you know, every morning you go, what have you written today? They go, yeah, that's good, that's good, that's good. I like the verse from that. Put that together with it. And that's kind of what they did at PWL. They had loads of people in little rooms just writing songs all day or coming up with parts and coming And then they would just... Or uh, Pete would, Pete Waterman apparently would, uh, would, would in the morning just hand out a load of seven-inch singles to everybody and go, yeah, I want one like that or like that or like that. You know, use this as your inspiration. And then at the end of the day, we're like, yeah, okay, that one's good. No, go back. That's not right. You know, and it was just... It was the notion of and which is a valid because i mean we all have it you know with improvise i mean you must find it too uh chicky you know you, you improvise you improvise you go back and look at the good bits it's kind of essentially the same process but it's on an industrial scale yeah you know the, the, well this actually ties in with i wrote you about that book that i'm reading the uh the song machine that's exactly what it's all about it's it covers like the history of motown and the brill building Timpan alley and the swedish you know music mafia so to speak <laughs> um it's like it, it's all these like there's this constant desire to build some type of factory where you've got you know 20 writers you got you try and you switch out pairs of them you have like some of them work for half the day and then they switch with other people for the other half the day and they try to crank out a song a day and you know eventually it is the monkeys on typewriters thing. there'll be something that will come out of it that's it must be very soul destroying as a as a writer though you don't get any time to feel <sighs> the moment yeah I, i've worked with a few of those sorts of people yeah when they've when they've had something that they've not turned in that they want to just do on do for themselves because they, they want to be artists too and then they come and work in the studio and, you know, and just, it's great. They have great ideas, but 
it's just nothing ever seems to happen for them because the money is too appealing being in these factories and that's where their heart and energy goes to and there's not much energy left for anything else no i know I, I would, in fact I'm, I'm, well max martin uh, obviously famously he started out with the uh, britney spears hit me baby one more time which i think in terms of an example of a pop a piece of pop music is kind of almost perfect it's got that mm-hmm. abaresque thing where every single element even like a hi-hat fill is a hook and that is just yeah. that takes kind of some some skill i mean whether you like it or not i mean some pop is beautifully crafted and is classic in that way and, that, uh, and max martin is one of those guys that he was just huge everywhere i mean i've never met the guy i don't know anything about him but he's just a name that everybody goes wow you know he must be minted but yeah. all the stuff yeah he, he, he is the of, got, oh sorry sorry, sorry, sorry no, no no go ahead Oh, I was going to say, he is the focus of, of that book. And, and it's really, a lot of it is about his method. And his method just, you know, I mean, he was in a metal band, you know, and, and he and he still kind of looks like he's in a metal band. And he just, but he just sort of came out of nowhere. And, and it suddenly, like, this guy, Dennis Pop, started putting all these people together. I mean, Max Martin and Dennis Pop, they, this guy started with, like, Ace of Bass and stuff ah, like that. So okay. he, even predating the uh, Britney Spears stuff, but the Britney Spears stuff is where they really broke big, and it's it's fascinating, fascinating oh, just a... knowing how they work. <laughs> you know, Dennis Pop, that's a great name. Dan. I, had, I wish I had mem- that. I wish I'd thought of that one. Remember, I got Dave Gamson on there years ago. Yes, yes, from uh, Scritter. But he, he he writes for Kelly Clarkson and was responsible for a lot of the. Ke- In fact, I think he was kind of the person behind Kesha with that Doctor Luke dude. But I mean, he's writing, and he's some of the stories he says about you know. The writing camps are quite amazing. I know, but I know guys who've quit. You know, singers who've quit ended up having songs written by committee and just kind of gone. This is stuff that I never wanted to be involved with. God damn, bring back punk! But there's a really interesting video out there at the minute about this millennial whoop. I don't know whether you've seen it. (laughs) Yeah, I think so. Yeah, it's like a whoop. whoop. Which is just brilliant. Well, it's just, just think of a police siren. No, 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 no. It's that fifth to the third to the fifth again. And how that has just dominated pop music over the last few years. Brilliant. Find it. Watch it. It's a millennial whoop. I think that might be something that has to be a contender for the show title. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Let's Let's hope it finishes it off. You know, like that. <laughs> I don't know. I, I thought I'd write an album with nothing but you know, fifth to the third to the fifth to the third to the fifth. Even you know, if you kind of I do a twelve-bar version, fifth to the third to the fifth to the third. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I'm probably guilty of that because, uh, yeah. Anyway, I won't go into that too much. Uh, let's have a look at this then. Eh? What about this? The uh, electro harmonics pedal uh, in a uh, in a Eurorack. Now, this is this. I've jumped to a further part where they go to self feedback, and this actually I think sounds pretty. This is the uh, Electrohonics uh, EHX o- organ C9 VC organ pedal. But this is feeding back on itself. Which I... I'm loving that. But, uh, aside of that, you could buy this. This is by ADDAC. It's the official... Uh, it's an official uh, one, so it's been made... Uh, by them uh, with the kind of blessing of electroharmonics and i wonder you know we've st- we started to see this happening i'm just wondering whether or not this is going to be a really cool format for effects pedals rather than you know when usually because in a studio you have to clear a table and you know put them all up and then figure out how to get into them if you've got them all all in a rack together if you had you know all the effects pedals that you wanted in your rack format you could you know, be almost like a system 500 effects rack it could be that could be quite an interesting pr- concept, and I don't know whether Charles uh, Chucky whether you use many effects pedals uh, at all. I do, I do. I use uh, Memory Man quite a bit. Um, I like the Pog. Uh, I like their synth- the micro synthesizer. I, I like. I, I, I use uh, Dynacomp all the time. I'll stick a Dynacomp, you know, old, old-fashioned Dynacomp on vocals and just see what happens. Of course, now I also, I also use DBX because it, it does the same sort of thing. But I, the, the thing is, if you can take all the major foot pedals, like even, you know, the Ibanez 2 Screamer, the, the original one, and things like that, stick those in a Eurorack, I will be so happy. So yeah, happy. I think that might because be I don't, I don't have enough horizontal space. I, I need more vertical space. So, ah. yeah. 
I know, Gaz, you're a big fan of, uh, of uh, well, A, uh, uh, performing live, so you have a load of foot pedals, but also uh, you've got a lot of interesting pedals. I mean, but would this be the sort of thing that might be your gateway drug into the uh, Eurorack format? Because it would make sense if you oh. could pick up, you know, those things and they could be then synced and, and, and modulated and what have you somehow. From Then that really opens a whole world of possibilities, right? Must resist, must resist. Uh, yeah, I mean, I'm a huge fan of uh, electroharmonics, so it's like, oh, you know. Um, this uh, this is quite cool. Uh, this this came the other day. This is a Swedish distortion called a Moog, which I think is Swedish for uh, trash. Ah, is that um, a distortion thing? Yeah, multi-band I met, distortion. I met, the, I met the guy at uh, Cymru Beats, actually, and he said he'd, he was thinking of... And I suggested that he send it to you, because... Thank you very yeah. much. So you got it. Um, yeah, yeah, but he's... He's looking to do them in Eurorack as well, so it's interesting. I think it makes a lot of sense. I think um, so. Yeah, that that. Yeah, I think it does make a lot of sense. I got to be honest, but I just don't know. I think I, I just such a, you know, I like just to be able to grab something, take it out. You know, if I go and do a gig, just grab only just a couple of pedals. I'm just not so sure about that. How that would actually work for me in in reality. Right. Um, you know, I love the. That, I mean, I would call like a like the way I use pedals like modular in nature. You know, I would just create a different um, array of pedals. Like, so the most recent gig, I just I've been doing this pop dungeon with Charlotte Church, and uh, I've been using lots of pedals on that. And yeah. uh, uh, I try to well, I mm, I've been trying different ways to make to to make it simpler. But to be honest, in the heat of the moment, just having just pedals on the floor that have fixed purpose is just. You know, it's really hard to beat that. But um, yeah, however, sorry, I deviate. Uh, it does sound really cool, though. And that electroharmonics, uh, that whole thing that they've got with those pedals, the like, like the the, um, the Rhodes one, the organ one, and the Mellotron one. Is that what they're doing then? They're bringing those. I don't know. So far, it's just this one. Um, yeah. So I don't know. I mean, I'm guessing you know some of them are going to be easier to to tinker with than others. I'm guessing the the, Vel- the Mellotron one's going to be a lot of digital interface. So maybe you're not going to get so much CV. Whereas maybe the organ one is there's more analog in points that you can modulate. You know, than than the other. I don't know. Okay. Well, I thought that the pedals looked like they were all the same uh sort of i i don't know. but but um what i love with electro harmonic stuff though is just how it has facilitated mayhem you know the 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 ranges of things and the you know I, so it electro harmonics and eurorack are a complete obvious you know it's an obvious thing yeah in a way well, and, Str- and strymon i think strymon would make a lot of sense because a lot of these people a lot of people are using strymon stuff live anyway you know you often see a strymon pedal and now what's happening is you know because we've been covering a number of events and we've seen people with strymon or or, or uh, um even tired pedals and they've now gone to the tip top uh z um 1000 3000 i forget what it is which is a dsp and using those you know and bring it and, and the herb verb and things and just bringing it into the rack so they don't have to have all these kind of floating satellite boxes i would just like to say uh chicky that in the youtube chat room uh you just need to velcro mate that's what they're saying you could stick you know, it on a board <laughs> i've got two huge spools of velcro from from sticking things on this stuff but you know in a in a like for live mixing live uh, ah, okay. having stuff like that in a euro rack oh that would be that would be excellent because i because i just don't have that kind of space you know the the horizontal space in a live situation but just to have that in a rack next to me because i do i carry a chaos pad with me and i do all sorts of outboard effects and things like that but just having something like that that'd be fantastic you know just having a having a, like a nice memory man in a euro rack I'd yeah be, i'd be thrilled i know right um Dave, what do you think? Are you kind of uh, are, you, are you thinking that would be a good way for you to go? Because you, you often got one, you know, you've got to find. You often see one of your Strymon pedals sort of balanced precariously on the corner of another synth while you're <laughs> using one synth somewhere else, and it's just, I just worry for all of those scratches. And and Mark, is that what's going on over there? Oh no, no I might be able to get. No, I don't know whether I can, but that's the AKS, and that up here is the dig. Right, just uh, precariously balanced on the El Capitan. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah, Euro crack. I, you've resisted. I, f- I feel like the guy who kind of backed <laughs> Betamax because I love my large format stuff, and everybody I know is going, "Hey, Euro rack this, Euro rack that," and I'm like, "Yeah, maybe, but yeah, I really don't need another habit right now." <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. 
Yeah. And it looks like a big habit because I've been into studios recently and it's like, yeah, that's a really expensive habit, that. Yeah, I know. And it never ends. In fact, every time I talk to Rick Smith, it's like he's spent another, you know, X amount. And it's just like, is it ever going to... No, it will never stop, will it? Well, like every So, yeah, so, I don't know. Yeah, the, the electro harmonics thing just makes total sense, though. I was, I was kind of... Ex- I'd love to see some of this stuff creep across into the large format stuff, but yeah, the electro harmonics. Of course, don't forget, most of that is um, Dave Cockrell, who was the original. Hooray! Ah, okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And okay, Ultimate well, Legend. you could get the. Uh, it's three hundred and sixty euros, so it's it's, still, it's not a, a a cheap item, but I mean, it's got a lot of extra patch points in it, and it's worth checking out. So uh, do take a look, and and there are others. I know that. Uh, uh, gosh, did Zvex put something in there? Or Strymon have started to put some things in. Uh, they, they showed some prototypes of stuff in Eurac. So, I mean, I guess it's also down to the amount of power that's required. You know, sometimes there's just not enough juice in a rack. You might need a bit more than, than is available. But it's well worth uh, considering. Because, I mean, in, in if you're using it for specific filtering or, you know, specific... Uh, uh, signal flows it, it definitely makes a lot of sense right i'm going to stop i'm going to finish with one last video because uh we uh, it sort of ties in with the topic we talked about this is the news of the new uh personas notion six it's a new notation software that but you know it's, it has its own built-in sound so you can voice a lot of these things and i know i'm not particularly noty but it has a very great a ver- there's a very great need for this in many cases when you're maybe articulating for an orchestra. <coughs> Handwriting recognition, that looks kind of interesting, I guess, if you're a, the sort of person that could write stuff in. This works on Windows, Mac OS, uh, tablets, I- iOS as well. Movie playback, annotations. Which I'm guessing if you're working with somebody who's going to be playing live is a really big deal. And there's also the uh, Steinberg Derek. Co, I think, which is coming soon, which is kind of based on a lot of the knowledge that was gone from Sibelius team. I know that one of the guys, uh, Daniel, um, is is working on that, and you know, it's not a copy of the Co, but a lot of that sort of uh, a lot of that uh, ethos is there. And I'm guessing, I don't know how much people use scoring. I mean, I used to use it a little bit. I remember, you know, there was a couple of times when we had a string player in and we'd print some stuff out. It was all very, very basic. But when you're getting into the big stuff, I don't know. Um, Gaz, have you ever had to score for quartets or anything like that? I mean, Cubase has got some notation in it. I mean, are you finding that that you have a need for that? Mm, maybe a little bit. Uh, for Actually, for a project coming up, I'm going to have to do it quite a bit. But, um, yeah, so, yeah, I mean, I generally rely on Cubase's own one because that's quite sophisticated. But um, this, I mean, Notion's been around for a while, hasn't it? But just PreSonus has only just... Bought it. Is that right? It's the I think same they've notion. had it for a little while, but yeah, uh, uh, it has hmm. been. Uh, yeah, it was. It, I think it was. It was Notion. It was on the iPad Notion. Is that? Yeah, I think it was. Some. I seem to remember meeting somebody at an Avid booth many years ago who was kind of put or M Audio, and there's some you know path through there, but I don't recall the details. Mm-hmm. Uh, but yeah, yeah, it's interesting that this is coming out. It's the same. It is very similar to the what's it called, Dorico, the standard Dorico. one. Yeah, I keep thinking yeah. Dorito, but. Yeah. That's very different. Yeah, mm-hmm. but uh, because that that yeah, Dorico actually does continue that uh, British wing of that stems right back to the beginning of uh, Sibelius, doesn't it? There's a there is a lineage there. Uh, sorry, that's an aside. Uh, I don't know. Yes, I yes and no. Not very much. Not very much. But I do like to do it, and I ha- I, I, I I like well with various projects I've had to work on. I've had to convert MIDI parts into scores and then try and tidy up the the scores because you know the the midi general you know if you just do a direct <laughs> midi to score it's a right old mess uh but but beyond that no not, this not seems like pretty good point. value so 149 bucks which actually seems mm. pretty reasonable for you get out of all of this uh, uh a bunch of sounds and what have you know and all that other i don't know i mean i guess what would be really handy for the you know if you could feed stuff in and it would automatically go well this is you know if the, what's it for 
it's for mm. a quartet right well this line will have to be played by so and so because it goes above the rate you know if it's got those sort of abilities to, to do it I don't know if that because if you don't know that stuff I'm guessing you know Ch- uh, Chicky you probably do if you've been doing a lot of scoring but what when you're scoring what is it that you're using um, I've been using Finale which I find really cumbersome um, the, I you know I started off I do stuff because I work on Pro Tools so much I use Pro Tools notation which is you know just practically non-existent i mean it's for you can do very basic things you know print out a horn part for somebody or something like that but the uh but then i'll i will use finale i, I don't i've never really gotten into sibelius i think sibelius is, is more popular in america and finale or no it's the other way around actually sibelius is more popular here and finale is more popular in america but i i use finale um but honestly i just so rarely have to do any notation work at all i mean it's just it's I want to use it. I want to use it more, but I just so rarely have to. But this does look great, though, because this is cheap. Uh, I can use my uh, Apple Pen on it. You know, <laughs> that sort of thing. I, I love the idea of that. Um, it, it isn't how I write music, though. I, I write music, you like know, I play stuff. it. Yeah. And, and then I figure it out later, you know. Even if the timing is something completely non non referenced, I'll figure something out. You know, I'll do like what Gaz was talking about, you know, throwing things into into um, the new melodyne, and then and then sort of figure out, oh, oh, that's the timing I meant apparently. <laughs> <laughs> so, but uh, yeah, I don't really use I don't really use it that much, other than a bit of finale every now and then. Oh, uh, we've got Hiltonius in the chat room, actually, who says, because uh, I think he's between flights, uh, he usually uses Sibelius, which I think, again, you know, is, uh, but that kind of got slightly orphaned, didn't it, because of the avid layoffs and what have you, and I think that's where it got a little bit kind of, people were, weren't sure what was going to happen, so I'm guessing that's why there are these kind of new, uh, larger, uh, all-encompassing notation programs to try and sort of take up some of that slack, I suppose, but I suppose they all have their own way of working, and it really depends, I mean, I lo- the, the handwriting recognition thing is probably really cool if you're classically trained and you can, you can think in musical notation, which is not something that I could do. I mean, I remember I did a course of musical notation, and it was... It was you were talking about the go-go beat uh, dave and i remember I, I came up with this brass line that was a go-go beat and i just had no idea i mean how the hell do you score that vibe i think it was a, a triplet six eight with a bit of sweet I, it was almost impossible to write in notes you know you, i think you just have to do it with a go-go feel at the top and then forget about <laughs> yeah, it, trying yeah, to figure yeah. out what, the, what the actual yeah a couple of dots and a bit of crescendo stuff and uh, uh, yeah i remember it being really difficult i don't know um, um, do you find have you had to uh, ever deal with that i remember you tell that great story about the the guy who left it till the day of the session and had to print out scores for an orchestra and it all went horribly wrong but you know but, on a dot matrix printer. On a dot matrix printer, while everybody <laughs> while everybody's sitting there, yeah, not such a great idea. But have, have you found you've had to? I mean, has there been times when you think I'd like to get a string section on this? So therefore, I'd probably need because usually it gets farmed out, don't you? You send it to somebody like Charles Hazelwood or one of those guys, and and they will just deal with it. And it comes back, and they turn up, and you go, yeah, that's nice. <laughs> yeah, no, I've the only no, I have. In fact, I was thinking, I. I only checked out Sibelius when it was owned by the two brothers, the pre-Avid thing. They were Cambridge, a couple of Cambridge brothers. I can't even remember their name now, but they were, they sold it. That was, that was quite a lot of money they made. But yeah, and then, yeah, but occasionally what happens with me is I'll get a score and then I have to write some MIDI parts from a score. Wow. Uh, you, with certain sounds, but that's so few and far between. I've, yeah. I used to be able to fly read like nobody's business, but now, wow, I don't think, I think it'd be like F, A. Oh, yeah, no, I can't at all. I remember we did, we, we went back in the day, we did a remix for uh, Charles Horner, who did the score for the Titanic. Uh, and it was, I can't remember what the track was, but they sent the multi track. James Horner. Sorry? James Horner. James Horner, sorry, yeah, James Horner. And they sent the multi track, but they also sent a score you know like a full-on like this this big score all written out and stuff and i was like wow that means nothing i've still got it somewhere because i wouldn't keep it as a you know i think i think they rejected whatever it was that we did and it probably got recycled into another track somewhere you know because you you take their music away and our music had nothing to do with it obviously it got failed anyway but i remember looking at that thing you know this means this is just Impo- I mean, I could probably have figured out just about what was going on after I could read at a very rudimentary level, but 
it feels so disconnected. Yeah. You really have to kind of know your stuff, right? I don't know, James, you do. I don't know, Gaz, do you sight read? I mean, is that something you have to do or you? Uh, it's funny. I, you know, when it comes to playing bass, I really struggle to read. I can play, I can read much better if I'm singing when I'm doing choir work uh, and other and other, other instruments. But bass, I don't know. Maybe I've just got such a different relationship with the bass. I'd really struggle to, to read with the bass. I just... I don't know. It feels like my groove is in a different place to my reading. Um, well, you, yeah, you lose that. I mean, when you're losing vital microseconds, I think that probably makes a big difference, doesn't it? But I wish I could read better, though, because like, when I was doing that opera a few years back, you know, all this Baroque bass lines with no bar repeats, you know, and just having to commit it all to memory <laughs> and just uh, being able to have read would have got me through that gig a lot easier, you know. But, um, it's hot. Yeah, yeah. I mean, it is a practice thing, but I feel it. You know, that's it's, how I like my A-level music. It's just memorised yeah. everything. Memorised. <laughs> it was Bach, Bach, two and three part inventions, and I memorised. I did the right hand, memorised the right hand, did the left hand, memorised the left hand, then put them all together, and then went into the exam. And they were, there was this moment where I thought, if they ask me, if they say stop, where are you now on the score? I've completely blown it. <laughs> <laughs> I, I should, by the way, add add one last uh, anecdote. I was watching an episode of Columbo, and uh, it was when Ricky Nelson was on there. And so this will appeal to us on all levels. In the studio, so he's in the, in the studio playing guitar, and they have an SM58 about four feet in front of him and another one about four feet above him. So, you know, you imagine how great that must have sounded. It sounded very close mic for some reason. And then when they said, okay, let's cut it there, uh, Ricky, and then they go into the control room, and the the producer is talking to the engineer, and he goes, you know, showing him the sheet music. He goes, okay, I want to cut from bar 58 to bar 62, and then we're going to paste from this version. Of and so the engineer then takes out sheet music, and he's like, cutting sheet music and and you know has nothing to do with tape <laughs> it's like i was just watching that and this is 20 years ago and i'm just going that is not how it works that is not how it works in the studio <laughs> wow. uh, so there you go Brilliant. there's my story <laughs> excellent thank you very much uh, we should probably finish with a couple of leaks uh or, or uh this is the the first thing that we've seen this is uh danny ivory there uh obviously at some core sort of endorsement in the corner there you see there's possibly uh, what looks like desktop odysseys carp odysseys uh with obviously no keyboard that looks like that might be coming up soon this uh, this is an official Korg uh thing so it's obviously very well uh you know it's been designed to be out there see what people think about that and also uh we have the news that um there have been a couple of leaks of pictures of uh a tr909 and a tb303 which i'm guessing are kind of ira versions of that and this is all ahead of the uh the roland 909 day which is coming up uh in 10 days september 9th yeah, yeah. september 9th quite soon so uh, i'm wondering if those things are going to happen whether anybody cares uh, i mean it seems i think we talked about it a bit last week it seems like an unusual thing to go for a 909 livery when in fact you know, most of the functionality as far as i could tell was put into the tr08 but with lime green and black um <laughs> I don't know, Dave. Are you excited by that? Will you? Uh, have you got a nine oh nine? No, I don't. Oh. I've got access to a couple of them, but I, no, I don't. I've got an eight oh eight. I don't know. I, I, I God. So, I'm kind of learning not to believe anything on the internet at the minute um, because it's the misinformation age now. But I did, did. I did. I see something, or maybe I dreamt it in my hallucinatory state. Um, that. There was something about them doing a 303, but with no resonance knob. Does anyone else? Does anyone else see that? Maybe it was a. Sp- I mean, it was probably. No, a spoon. I, I've not seen that one. Because I thought that was kind of borderline genius idea. It's just like no filter car for no resonance. No, this was just no resonance. But I thought that would sound very that different, somewhere. wouldn't it? <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're going to reinvent acid house. Yeah, yeah, with no, no residence. No acid, yeah. It would be sort of a- acid house, wouldn't it, rather than... <laughs> oh, excellent. Yeah, I don't know, maybe a, 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 a dedicated... I, I kind of fancy a 909, but they're so expensive now. And Still are. Half of me thinks... Why? Yeah, you know, well, no, no, I mean, half of me thinks, yeah, you know, if there's something... I, I, I'm hearing about a D50 as well. Oh, yeah. I keep hearing on the room of iron, but 
Actually, to be honest, I'm more interested in what Spectrasonics are going to announce tomorrow. Oh, yeah. Well, that's right, because uh, that's the other news. Uh, on Facebook, I, I, have, I, I, supposed to, I meant to put that in because I saw it late last night, was uh, 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 Eric Persing's been posting, tomorrow I re- we, re- we announced news of something that I've been working on for 10 years. And I did, when, when I interviewed Eric uh, yeah, yeah, a while yeah, yeah. back, there was a little bit of a kind of, there's a moment where he talks about some hardware thing. And that's really well, interesting to me. And I, so I'm wondering whether that's what it's going to be, because, I mean, that's the sort of thing that might be the case, which would be great. I mean, not that I don't love Omnisphere and Spectrosonics, what they've done. I just find it's such a deep and, and, and tangled piece of software because it's so many options. I, I can't. I, I'm sitting in front of it and I just go, um, flip another preset. I know. What were you saying, Dave? No, he said, uh, and I remember this very vividly, there is something coming, but it's, and it's not what you'd expect so we can think completely. Anyway, all will be revealed tomorrow. It's not. Uh, yeah, hold on, didn't yes. you used to play uh, trumpet? Oh, there you go. <laughs> it's yeah, got a, it's, a, it's a new trumpet. There you go. <laughs> An omnisphere horn, a synth horn. Somebody said. Was... Somebody said another logo, a different logo change. It was just like, yeah. Can you imagine the furore eh, if it was just as simple as a logo change? Yeah, no, I don't, yeah. I've been working on it for ten years. The design committee's been a very, a very tiring process. Yeah, I can't imagine it's that. I know, Gaz. What do you think? You think it's likely to be a bit? I think it's likely to be hardware, but I, I again, I, I don't know. No, I, it's, there's no. He hasn't. What has Eric said? He has only said that it's just coming tomorrow, though. Or yeah. Tomorrow. So tomorrow's the big day. <sighs> Well, I mean, Spe- Spectrosonics, they take their time with whatever they do, don't they? So whatever it is, it's going to be good. Uh, that's that's for sure. So that's ooh, exciting. Um, and that's, yeah, that's nice. So the tease is only one day long. I mean, we're still waiting to hear what the new uh, Electron box is. That's been teased for ages now. So, yes, a one-day tease. That sounds quite good. So, yeah, roll on tomorrow. Yeah, it'll be the Omnihorn. Omnihorn. Oh. <laughs> Omnihorn. Omnihorn. Oh, hold on, know, hold on. It, it, it would be it, it would be great if someone did some fantastic horn thing because I haven't really heard anything fantastic. Well, funnily this. enough, there's a, on the Roland Facebook, which I, I just happened to see it today. That they're, they're opening up a whole new product category, and it looks very much like a wind controller to me of some kind. There's sort of finger valves or trumpet or clarinet or saxophone or something like that. And then Roland, because Yamaha uh, and Akai did wind controllers, and some lots of people swear by them, still use them, and they're great for controlling synths and all sorts of stuff. So maybe you know there's going to be a, a Roland wind controller at some point as well you know because they didn't yeah, really fantastic they've never really yep. gone for that have they not they even breath really. not even breath control d-beam was their thing so much yeah. more much more hygienically sound you know very sort <laughs> of japanese when you consider that the, the, the whole th- of uh, story it's about the going d- to japan with the toilet seat dryer. covers you know it's like you don't touch anything <laughs> it's all going to be like you know interchangeable <laughs> it's it's like the dyson hand dryer it's it's the, the you know they're mentioning about, about the <laughs> about them coming out with this uh, TR-909 sort of thing. I hope it doesn't really look like the TR-8. It's only because the TR-8 is exactly how I pictured 2016 in about 1975. You know, it just says <laughs> the green and everything. I, just, I hope they make something this much more appealing looking. But yeah, I know, I'm sure that'd be a lot of fun. Yeah, absolutely. Well, it feels like we're probably at the uh, at the point where we could we could knock this thing on the head. It's been much fun and, and another fantastic rambling me- meander through uh, our subconscious and uh, uh, first thing that comes out of our heads. I was uh, speaking for myself. <laughs> type of uh, type of uh, conversation, which is what makes Sonic Talk such a great experience for all of us. Uh, certainly, I speak for myself. I hope it is for everybody else too. So, I want to say thank you to all our viewers uh, been watching on YouTube Live and also in the chat room. I'll just give a little. Give the chat room a wave, like Gus Honeybun. Uh, that will be a reference that will only a few people will know. Uh, and I want to say thank you very much for joining us. Also, thanks to our sponsors, uh, Isotope. Remember, if you want to enter the competition, all you have to do is uh, tweet the hashtag Ultimate Voice, that's one word, and Vocal Synth as one word, two separate hashtags to at Sonic State and at Isotope Inc. to be entered for the competition to win Vocal Synth, the vocal processor. So uh, I want to say thank you to our guests, uh, Charles Chicky Reeves, thank you very much for joining us. I'm very pleased that you could make it. Uh, hopefully, see you again. And uh, what you got coming up next week? Anything of great excitement? I'm working on a, a sound design for a game, so I'm doing a bit of music and a lot of sound effects. So, ah, so did, did you? You were telling me that you were using sort of a single source for that. Uh, well, I was using the uh, Moog 15 app for a lot of that. 
Right. Yeah, which I love. Oh, sorry, Moog. Sorry. Um, hey, I now I'd just like to say thank you very much. That's the word Moog from an American. That is all I yes. need for... for uh, <laughs> yes, thank you. I, I love that app, though. It's amazing. It's amazing. And it's the whole reason I got the iPad Pro, so... Ah, right. That is cool. Well, I, I yeah. wish you very much luck with that. And Dave, uh, I'm glad to see you're you're well and better and uh, on the mend. Uh, what's what have you got planned for next week? You uh, you got well, I suppose nothing you can talk to us about really. It's always very secretive around at your manner. We really must get together physically and enjoy a drink together. It feels like a long time. Maybe yeah, we should yeah, just do definitely. that. <laughs> definitely. Yeah, actually, yeah, sock next week. Let's just do that. Yeah, all week. All week. <laughs> yeah, no, maybe not. <laughs> but Dave, thank you very much for joining us. Uh, do go and nice check out Dave at g4software.com for all their fabulous software instruments. And we also have Mr. Gaz Williams, who's there. Is that your reverend bass? Yes. Oh, I love that yep. bass. That's got a, such yeah. a lovely th- skinny neck. That's the one you play with the rumblows, isn't it, right? Yeah, yeah. Reverend Rumblefish. Reverend so, Rumble. <laughs> Yeah, the Rumble is kind of named after this bass, partly. <laughs> oh, excellent. Yeah. So what have you got? Um, You've uh, you finished the album? You got any th- another thing coming up? I Well, I mean, we literally finished the session like uh, five minutes before the show today. So um, it's great because i got this Ooh. pedal to try now. I haven't been able... It came yesterday and I haven't had a single second to play with it. So I'm just bursting to, to play with it. So I've plugged it in now. From what I remember, hey! the guy, from what I remember, the guy said it had a really. Oh no, he's straight broken. He's straight. He's so excited. Genius. Wow. <laughs> yeah, it sounds great. Has it got like a very high Q resonant filter on it and distortion? Is that what I'm remember from just, what he told me? It's four bands. It's just four. It's just simple. Four oh, bands. Low, low bass mid, walls. <laughs> uh, hey! uh, oh, there we go. Battle of the multi-instrumentalists. What can I reach for? Uh, nothing, really. Horn. Not the horn. No, I can't play the horn. No, I've got no, absolutely nothing to reach for uh, at all, I'm afraid. So, Anyway, the guys. Button. <laughs> the mute button. <laughs> Yeah, I'll be. The, I'll, I'll just mix. Yeah, I'll just. I'll be. I'll be mix, uh, mixing and carry on mixing. Yeah, like that. Anyway, guys, thank you very much for joining us. It's been very much fun, Gaz. Uh, I'm hoping that we'll see you soon. We've probably got a bunch of things that we need to uh, film. I think. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah yes. Yeah. Definitely. Very. So, good. Can you see what's there? Can you see what's there in, in the middle? Not there? quite. Uh, it's uh, one of those. Um, Boss RC five four five. Ah, you went back to it. Yeah, it's all it's it's the hub of the system now. So it's the clock, and I, and the way I've got it set up with the X is brilliant. You can just noodle on stuff, and, and you can just hit any of those pat, any of those things, and it starts recording. Because the new thing in the version two point means you can have dummy loops, and so I so I set the first one up just to be uh, pre set it up to be uh, a one bar loop. The next one's an eight bar loop, uh, a four bar loop. The next one's an eight bar loop. 16 bar loop and a 32 bar loop so they're all empty loops so when you press start all of the loops start playing but they're completely empty so at any point in time whatever you're playing on any of the other keyboards you can just hit one of those oh, and it'll play buttons and you can just overdub whatever you're doing just into whichever one of them but because they're all going at different cycles it's brilliant you know because you can just put things into the one bar loop or you can put things into the 32 bar loop and it's so instant it's such a cool system wow so you can because i know they'd had an upgrade didn't they they went to a version yeah, two software that, that that's why i got it because i've been because it really makes sense to that that workflow and it's cool because it's like uh all the other sequences because there's loads of sequences there the um beat step pro the little cork one the uh, the sq1 and the circuit and the volkers and the they all collect the analog four, they all they all go from the same clock, so they're oh, all yeah. so all of them are running. But it's great because I can just put like, a, you know, my electric bass. I can just put them into if so. If I work on like a sixteen bar pattern, I could just put like a like a sixteen bar bass line in into the loop part of it. That's uh, cool. But the cool thing is, I start my main project here, and then that lot all syncs to it as well. So oh, ne- got- so you could just get walk over and start kind of noodling, and, and it'll be synced. And so, are you using? Yeah. Uh, are you just taking the stereo out of the X Air? Uh, I am for monitoring, but everything's going into discrete channels. So from yeah, the but when part- you're at the the loop, what's where's the loop point coming from? Yeah, loop point's coming from a pair of uh, like a, a pair of 
oh bus but i've also got a, like a i've also got a main feed coming out as well on a switch so if i want to i can record the looper back into itself as well uh so if i want to make a submix of a, of anything that's going on off the looper i, I can just uh because i can mute the input ah uh, right you, so you could just like mix down in real time yeah mix down into yeah it's so much fun it's just like and it's no computers in the system now so Ooh, uh, that sounds fun. yeah I did it's consider top, it because I've got I've actually got a got a gig booked in for December third I think through uh, Ned Rush down in uh, Winchester at a, like a proper gig <laughs> and I haven't written anything or um, or played anything since the last one so I, I I need to get that set up again and just kind of start mm. uh, start enjoying a bit of that and that sounds like it could be something quite useful mm. yeah yeah it's good it seems like it's the version two software though that has kind of facilitated that sort of stuff um which which is dead cool and actually the effects thing on that's quite nice because you can um you can set it up so only certain tracks respond to the kind of track effects so like beat repeat stuff's really great fun when you have it on um just certain elements but not other elements it's it's, it's a lot of oh, fun well, i'll have to come over and we'll have to have a look at that or bring it over and you show me what it does because uh, they're pretty reasonably priced aren't they the 505 yeah, you can get them for about three sixty or something. Ooh, yeah, that sounds three seventy. Yeah, sounds it's good. good. Right. Anyway, um, I shall probably uh, switch. I shall. I shall. I shall terminate the stream uh, soon. But thank you very much, everybody, for watching. Thanks for you all in the chat rooms and the live watchers. Always nice to have that extra frisson of a couple of mm. hundred people shouting at the screen, potentially behind be, behind the uh, behind the interweb. Anyway, thank you. <laughs> all right. Right. See you guys later on. See you later. Bye. Cheers. Guys. Bye. Nice. Nice, uh, nice meeting you. Bye bye. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> bye bye. Right. Um, I think that's it for this week. So what I'm going to do now is uh, I've got a little end credit section that I play that saves me having to do annotations at the end of the video. So I'm going to do that now. So we'll fade to black and we'll see you all next time. Thank you very much for watching, everybody. Never works. Ah, there we go.